Hey everybody, I'm Scott Graham, Extension Entomologist with Alabama Extension and Auburn University. And today I'm going to give a little bit of uh, an update kind of on some projects and things that we did in 2021 and some considerations for insect pest management in peanuts going into 2022. So just to kind of look back through uh, 2021 and review as, as far as uh, from an insect uh, management situation. So overall, uh, insects were not a major yield limiting factor. Uh, we did have pretty good incidence of tomato spotted wilt virus this year, which is obviously transmitted by thrips and uh, a, lot of, a lot of thrips in fields, a lot of uh, 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 tomato spotted wilt virus. We had some, some fields that required attention from defoliating caterpillars like soybean loopers and velvet bean caterpill caterpillars, particularly in the uh, southern part of the state. And one of the other big topics of discussion is, is the loss of chlorpyrifos. Uh, you know, hopefully that won't end up being too bad for us in 2022 and in the future, uh, but there are a couple of different pests that, that may require some extra uh, research and things to figure out management strategies with the loss of chlorpyrifos. And I just always kind of like to, to see that, that graph there, a chart of where we're growing our crops in Alabama. And as is no surprise to anybody, the, the great majority of them are in, in uh, South Alabama with the majority being in the wire grass and about 30% in, uh, in the Gulf Coast or Southwest. Um, but this year we had 182,000 acres up, up about 1,000 acres from last year. Uh, but anyway, I, I just always like to kind of look at that, that chart and see where our acres actually are. So one of the big things uh, for, for economic uh, insect management in, in a crop like peanuts is, is you know, scouting using thresholds. Very, very important that we have a plan and that really needs to start before seed even go in the ground. So thinking about thrips, uh, management thrips protection, things like that. As I mentioned, scouting, very, very important. We need to actually be out in these fields seeing what insects are present, what insects aren't present, what levels they're at uh, and using proper thresholds which may be the ones that we recommend here uh, with Alabama Extension it may be some that that you and, and your field advisors are comfortable with from from your history whatever it is you know, knowing that we're only making insecticide applications when we'll see a good economic return on it but at the same time you know we need to be sure to treat when we need to you know there are things like spider mites that we have to worry about that are can be pretty expensive to control, but you know, we, we can't let a, another insect eat us up because we're, we're scared of situations like that. So very, very important that we have a plan, that we scout, use some, some form of a threshold that we have, treat when we need to, but you know, that's don't just throw out insecticides because we're going across the field with a fungicide anyway. Uh, let's, let's make sure we're only spraying when we do need to. So thrips are, uh, are the most consistent insect pests that we have uh, in, in soybean, excuse me, in peanuts in Alabama. Uh, you know, we've got to have something at plant, whether that's a, a liquid in furrow, like a, a metacloprid or a granular, like Thymet or, or uh, Autocarb or AgLogic. You know, we need to have something at plant. Really helps to, uh, to plant a resistant variety. And, and with that, obviously, I mean a resistant from tomato spotted wilt virus because that is really the key thing uh, in most cases that we're concerned about with thrips is is not as much the damage that they do and, and they can in some cases cause enough uh, feeding damage that it, it stunts the plants and causes uh, delays in maturity and things but really what we're most concerned about is uh, trying to reduce tomato spotted wilt virus uh, and with that you know we uh, Dr. Mander uh, Shear and I put out a uh, uh, or updated our an extension publication on tomato spotted wilt virus and peanuts. So that's that's on our website there. It's publication A N R zero five seven four. If you want some more detailed information on uh, on tomato spotted wilt virus and peanuts, and kind of an updated of as of twenty twenty one, kind of what we know about it here in Alabama. And this is a, a chart here just showing the, the peanut RX, which is something I'm sure Dr. Shear will talk a lot about uh, in her uh, presentation. And I know this is, this is kind of a, 
a small thing. You can't really see it uh, on the slide there. That's not important. Uh, you know, hopefully, we're familiar with this. We've seen it before. We, we use it to get a good idea of, of the, uh, the risk of disease for our peanuts when we're planting in Alabama. Uh, and it's obviously got a rating scale for tomato spotted wilt virus as well, which is why as the entomologist I'm showing this graph. So when we think about the, the peanut RX and some of the recommendations that we have for, uh, for reducing tomato spotted wilt virus, these are kind of the, the key points on that uh, chart to be aware of, the varietal selection, so planting a resistant variety uh, compared to planting a susceptible variety. Planting dates are also very important. We kind of hit that sweet spot around mid-May, between the 11th and the 25th, where we're, we feel like we're at the, the greatest reduction of risk of tomato spotted wilt virus incidence. Plant populations are also important, and note that is not seeding rate, that's actual uh, plant populations and, and we see our, our lowest risk of, of the virus when we have a plant population of four plants per foot or greater. Uh, it's, it's a little bit higher risk at three plants per foot and a pretty high risk when we get below three plants per foot. So if we can try to, to get our seeding rates just right to average four plants per foot, that really helps the thrips can, can infest those uh, plants that are kind of staggered by themselves maybe if, if we've got a you know a, a foot or so or we've got some skippy stands that's where we tend to see more and more uh, thrips injury and tomato spotted wilt virus and at plant insecticide which 4-8 or, or thymed is the only one that consistently provides a reduce of tomato spotted wilt virus but uh, as i'll show in a little bit we've got to have something at plant whether or not it's thymet to manage thrips row patterns also important uh, you know, research has shown that we tend to have less virus when we plant twin rows compared to single rows. Tillage, uh, in general, we see less drips injury pretty much across all of our crops uh, where we have uh, reduced tillage compared to conventional tillage, and, and peanuts are no different. It, having that uh, little bit of, of uh, plant material there kind of confuses the thrips a little bit. They've got a little bit more stuff to go to, so maybe they don't quite get on our, our crops or our peanuts quite as much. And then if you uh, use the, the herbicide classic or not, that can kind of stunt the peanuts a little bit and, and exacerbate sometimes uh, thrips injury and, and uh, tomato spotted wilt virus. So you, you go on that, that form and you fill out what what your, uh, your plan is for this season for all of these different things, and it'll give you your risk of, if your, your numbers end up to greater than 115, you're at a high risk. If you're uh, 70 to 110, you're moderate, and less than 65 is low. So if you are at a high risk, maybe you can see some things prior to planning that you can change in, in your plan with your system to try to reduce that risk a little bit, because, you know, the, the 4 8 the at plant insecticides can help, uh, but, but it's really best that we can try to do everything we can uh, without just relying on that one insecticide to reduce tomato spotted wilt virus incidence and, and improve our thrips control. So here's uh, just a couple of images of, of tomato spotted wilt virus incidence on peanut plants. Uh, at different stages you see, it may, may be a little bit hard to see on the screen there, but the image on the right, you can see those what we call hits of, of the virus where we've got significantly stunted plants. Uh, and that's where we will we'll see you know, issues with yield when we have a lot of that stunning out in the field. Just showing some uh, data from a research trial that uh, Chris Balkum and I did at, on the research station at the Wiregrass in Headland this year. So this is looking at uh, our thrips injury on a rating scale of zero to five. So we just kind of went out and, and walked the uh, plots and, and had a zero is, is no damage, a five is uh, Basically, they're killing the plants out there. Very, very significant damage from thrips, not from the, the virus, just the thrips uh, kind of stunning and crinkling, leaf, crinkling of leaves and things like that. And, and what you see here is that at 15 days after planting, really regardless of what we use, we, we got pretty good control, uh, particularly when you compare it to the untreated check. So in this, we've, we've got a metacloprid or Admire Pro uh, with and without the vellum uh, fungicide 
and then also within the vellum fungicide we've got it either single rows or twin rows we've got a single row application of AgLogic or Aldicarb at seven pounds uh, we've got Thymed at six pounds in a single row Thymed at eight pounds in a twin row so that's split four and four and then we've also got uh, really uh, too low of a rate probably I'm, I'm not sure that's on the label actually a 13.6 ounce rate of of uh, Vidate with and without the fungicide abound in, in the single and twin row. But at 15 days after planting, our initial rating, you know, we got, got good control out of pretty much everything, uh, significantly reduced our uh, stunted plants and thrips injury. We went back at, at 22 days later, you can see still pretty consistent trends, pretty similar. We got good control uh, compared to the untreated check with everything that we used. However, uh, there are some differences there. You see the, the orange bars, the Vitates didn't quite uh, hang on as consistently as did some of our other treatments. Uh, the Metacloprids look good, AgLogic and Thymet look good. Uh, but overall, like I said, we, we did a pretty good job of, of managing thrips injury regardless of what at plant strategy we used. So when we look at, uh, so this is the percent incidence of tomato spy wilt virus in the plots. Uh, so this is showing, we, we went out at, at 54 days after planting, walked the entire uh, four rows of, of the plots and estimated what percentage of, of those four rows was impacted by tomato spot and wilt virus, whether that was stunted plants or, or showing the, the symptoms on the leaves. And again, we got pretty good control no matter uh, what we, uh, used, we significantly reduced it compared to the untreated check. Now we, we do have there where uh, Thymed at eight pounds uh, provided better control than the other products. AgLogic at seven pounds provided better control than the other products. And you know that's something that we might see you know once every couple of years out of AgLogic or, or uh, out of carb that it will uh, help us with with the reduction of the virus and it's you know really one of the best insecticides we have in, in row crops in the south but it does not consistently year in and year out uh, show the ability to reduce tomato spy wilt virus like Thymet has or, or 4-8 has over the years so if we're really trying to uh, use something to reduce tomato spotted wilt virus incidence. It's, it's uh, Thymet or, or Forade is, is really our best option. We also went through and, and took pictures of the plots uh, using just a, an application on, on a phone called uh, Canopio or Canopio. And essentially that is, uh, you see these images here of, of the white peanut leaves and then the, the black background. So this, this app is able to, you, you take a picture and it turns everything in that image that is green to white and then everything that's not green to black. So you can see what they call the uh, percent green canopy cover. And so this is just an image of, of what the first rep of our trial looked like in the center two rows of each plot. You can see pretty obvious in our untreated there, the, the first image top left, uh, a lot of stunning and, and things. And then you see the Thymet twin rows in the middle on the bottom. Uh, really, really good canopy closure there at 54 days after planting. And when we look at our ratings, uh, there were some some differences. Some of that's maybe a little academic in, in the percent green uh, cover index. And again, you know, pretty much anywhere we had something at plant, we had significantly higher percent green canopy cover or you know, we're getting closer to the middles lapping where we had an insecticide seed treatment compared to where our untreated uh, check was. When we look at yield at the end of the day, which is what's most important, uh, everything significantly increased yield or, or preserved yield compared to our untreated check. Uh, you see that, that line there on the bottom, a uh, little less than 3,000 pounds and, and we're up uh, over four, approaching five, where we had some form of an insecticide uh, at plant to manage thrips. So again, kind of the moral of this, this story is we've really got to have something to manage thrips and depending on what we use, it, it may or may not uh, reduce tomato spotted wilt virus injury or symptoms, but, but we've got to have something. And here's something interesting I, I kind of noticed when I was looking at the data. Uh, 
in this study, we tended to have higher yields in our single row treatments compared to our twin row treatments. I know that may not be exactly what we're used to seeing or, or historically what we think we would expect to see, but it's just something interesting I thought in this study when, when I compare our uh, insecticides used uh, at both twin and single row spacings, we had about 200, not significant, but about 283 pounds of peanuts more in our single row compared to our twin row. So just, just our take on points, and I've kind of been hammering them all along, uh, but you know, thrips are, they're gonna infest 100% of our acres every year. They're gonna be out there, they're gonna be feeding and trying to transmit this virus. Uh, you know, it's important that we consult the, the peanut RX guide, try to minimize our risk of tomato spotted wilt virus every way that we can. We've got to use something at plant uh, to, to manage thrips. Foliar sprays may or may not have a fit. It kind of depends on the situation. Um, not, not always uh, see a return there, but, but sometimes we can see uh, benefits from making foliar sprays to supplement our uh, or at plant insecticides. So now moving on to defoliating caterpillars, which uh, again were uh, caused some issues for us in, in different fields across the state this year. You know, really there's a lot of different uh, critters that may be in the field. Uh, kind of the big ones there are those on the right, the velvet bean caterpillar, green clover worm, and soybean looper. We can early in June, we may see a flush of tobacco bud worms. We may get some corn ear worms in the field. Uh, you know, get a call on redneck peanut worms every now and then, but, but they're really uh, not, not very consistent. Uh, but it's important that we can identify these insects and, and know what's in the field because that can drive uh, insecticide, uh, insecticide use decisions. Uh, certainly plays a role in the economics of, uh, of how much we have to uh, pay to make an application. As far as when peanuts are susceptible to, defoli to defoliation, it's really important that we avoid high levels uh, early in the season. And when I say high, I mean, you know, try to preserve at least half the defoliation. Uh, I doubt that we'll quite let it get there, uh, but, but at least 50% defoliation during the early uh, part of the year. Once we get to that peak pod fill around 80 or so days after emergence, that's when it really becomes important uh, to, to monitor defoliation and try to keep it around that 15 to 20 percent uh, loss. So in other words, if we start feeling like we've got to 15 or 20 percent of our soybean leaves are defoliated, we need to make an application. That can be difficult to do, uh, to, to judge that defoliation, especially as peanuts get bigger. It's, it's hard to see the leaves in the, you know, kind of down closer to the ground in the bottom of the canopy. Uh, so we can also use a, a threshold of, of four worms per foot earlier in the year and then six to eight worms per foot as we get a little bit later around that 80 day mark. Uh, you know, there's just more foliage there for the, the caterpillars to feed on so we can stand and have a little bit more in the field during those times. As far as controlling the defoliators, you know, generally speaking, it's really not that difficult. Uh, most of our label insecticides do a, a pretty good job. Uh, one, one, uh, one rarity there would be the soybean looper, which is a little bit more difficult to control. It's, it's got resistance to most of the different insecticides that, that we uh, use. So in those situations, we've got to use the diamides, which are a little bit newer and they're not quite generic yet, uh, but, but they do uh, do a good job of, of controlling soybean loopers. So with that, it's, it's very important that we scout and properly identify these, these pests because we can control velvet bean caterpillars for you know, a couple, two, three, four dollars an acre. Uh, but if it's soybean looper and we, we spray that pyrethroid, we can make things a whole lot worse. We, we've got to go with those dye mods in that situation. So, so good scout. And, and pest identification is critical for management of defoliating caterpillars. Spider mites are another pest that as we uh, continue into this uh, reduced till, no-till uh, situations and, and uh, systems, uh, we, we tend to, we're seeing more and more issues with mites. Now this is just the classic hot dry weather pest. 
Now, they're likely in, in most, if not all, of our peanut fields across the state year-round, or all season, excuse me, just waiting on a 10- to 14-day period of, of really hot, dry weather and maybe a, a foliar insecticide or two uh, of a pyrethroid or a, an organophosphate, something like that, knocks out the beneficial in, uh, insects in the field. There's nothing really there to leave the mites unchecked and they can explode on us pretty quick. You know, the issue with, with spider mites is we've got a couple of good options for control, but they're not the most economical thing. You know, they're, they're costly, they're good, but they cost a lot. That would be portal and comite too. So, you know, this is a pest that we really try to kind of uh, manage by just not uh, flaring them, not, not causing issues, so maybe not making uh, sequential, you know, seven-day applications of broad-spectrum insecticides that knock out the beneficial insects in the field because we can control them. It just really uh, gets into our pocket to control spider mites. So last thing I'll, I'll talk about is, is this loss of chlorpyrifos and, and kind of what I think that's going to mean for us here in Alabama. Now the, the good thing is in general you know, we didn't really have uh, widespread use across the state. Uh, we, we did have a fit in some cases, you know, two, two pests in particular, the peanut burrower bug and, and root worms are pests that right now, you know, with the loss of chlorpyrifos, we really don't have any answers. You know, I've been talking with a colleague, uh, Dr. Mark Abney at Georgia, and, and right now there's just, just really not much we can do if we get infestations of, of these pests in the field with, with the loss of chlorpyrifos. You know, with peanut burrower bug, we know it's a dry season pest, so you know, at the very least we can potentially do some tillage in at-risk fields or, or fields that have had historic infestations of burrower bugs. Obviously that can only be done prior to planting, um, but that's, that's really the only option we've got now if, if we feel like you know, we may see issues with that later in the year. Root worms are a wet season pest, and right now, unfortunately, we really just don't don't have any options that we're comfortable with uh, to manage root worms if if they get into fields later in the season. Lesser cornstalk borers are another pest that that chlorpyrifos was uh, registered for, but uh, really we can control them pretty good. Sometimes just with a good rain uh, is is all we need to to handle lesser cornstalk borers, but if we do get into a situation where it's dry and we, we can't, uh, we, we don't get the rain that we need, uh, you know, the diamides provide good control, diamond, uh, or diamides, which will be Prevathon or Besiege, uh, diamond, insect growth regulator provides good control. Dimlin can be a little sporadic, but maybe if we go out, you know, piggybacking with fungicides and just have it in the system for a while there, maybe that could potentially help us uh, so we're, we're looking for answers right now for this loss of chlorpyrifos, but uh, as of right now, we really don't have, uh, unfortunately, much, much good to say for peanut burrow or bug and, and root worms. And there can be a lot of other uh, critters in the field, you know, so that, that's why it's important, like I said, that we scout, we're in the field, we, we know what insects are there, what insects aren't there. Uh, and and we, we pull the trigger when we need to on an insecticide application, but we don't get a little trigger happy and, and spray a lot more than we need to. So here, here's my information. Uh, you know, we're, we're always trying to put out uh, things as we learn them uh, via several different ways on Twitter, through our uh, newsletters, the Alabama Crops Report newsletter. Uh, the Syngenta Pest Patrol Hotline is kind of a a weekly thing we, we put out during the season. It's just a two or three minute update on, on what we're hearing really across all row crops in Alabama and, and things that you might need to be thinking about on, on your farm and in, in your uh, situation. We've got our new Alabama Crops Report podcast that we started last year and we'll continue that through this season, uh, which is a little bit more, a little bit longer form than the Pest Patrol updates are. The, the podcast is kind of a 15, 20 minute interview a uh, conversational style interview with our uh, folks, uh, different specialists and, and REAs and things across the state, just giving updates and, and things to think about and consider on, on your farm. And of course, we've got our peanut IPM guides where we have all of our up-to-date recommendations and performance ratings on, on control uh, and things like that. But 
or any time, if I can ever be any help at all, please don't hesitate to call me, uh, text, email, whatever. You know, we're, we're here to help. The, the uh, Alabama Extension Peanut team is, is always uh, glad to help any way we can. So thank you for uh, listening to this presentation. Again, any questions, please, please let me know.